Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Typical Skeptic Podcast. I have one of my favorite guests with me. I think this is the third or fourth time she's been on my show. She's just a master of what she does and who I'm talking about is Mary Rodwell. She's the founder and principal of the Australian Close Encounter uh, resource network ACERN and his primary role is to pro- pro- provide professional counseling, support, hypnotherapy, and information to individuals and their families with anomalous paranormal experiences, particularly specializing in abduction or contact experiences. Mary is recognized internationally as one of the world's leading researchers in the UFO and contact phenomena. She is the author of Awakening, How Extraterrestrial C- Contact Can Transform Your Life, and The New Human 2016. Uh, awakening to our new cosmic heritage. Mary has also produced two EBE award-winning documentaries, Expressions of ET Contact, A Visual Blueprint, and Expressions of ET Contact, The Communication and Healing Blueprint. Most recently, Mary has been featured in several documentaries. Um, you might have saw her on Amazon Prime. You know, I know that's where I found out about her from. And uh, so she stays busy between. So with all that said, I'd like to give her a big warm welcome to the show. Mary, thanks for coming back on. How are you? Rob, it's an absolute pleasure to talk with you again and to share a little bit more of what's been going on, perhaps. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm so excited to hear about that. So what has been going on? How? What's 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 new? I mean, have you, let me ask you this. Have you heard any information updates on the space arcs? Yes, I do. And I did a presentation that was recorded for um, I'm just trying to think Prague. The late the UFO conference in Prague just about a week ago or whatever, and it was to do with um, a lot of to do with the space arcs. But it's simply because I did a regression with a lovely lady in the US, and I did, knew nothing about the space arcs at this time. This is what I really want to um, make very clear. I had no knowledge of them whatsoever. In this particular regression, this beautiful lady Beth. Beth Noyes, she's been on my show, I think. Is that who you're talking about? Beth's story is where she um, had information from these beings, but she couldn't remember the message. So she asked me to help her with a regression to find out what the message was. This message came from her remembering a past life in Atlantis. And in that past life, she and her friends were light workers and they failed in their mission because of what happened there. And they've been reincarnated now to carry out that mission. And one of them is to do with what she was seeing was the symbol she was being shown, a message from the Arcturians. And she was shown the space arcs, one of them in the Bermuda Triangle. Um, And this was really interesting that this was all new to me, including her being shown particular plants that were going to be gifted to humanity, as well as you know, this is the time for the big shift on the planet, etc. And interestingly, within a week of getting her information, I then found out that Dr. Michael Sala had whistleblower, um, JP and others that were coming out with these space arcs, which he had actually told me about the week previously. So that opened up a Pandora's box because it was actually confirming much of what Michael Sala and the whistleblower was talking about and, and others that were coming about these space arcs, particularly the one in Bermuda. So the interesting thing is Beth may have mentioned to you, she's been part of a remote viewing group. And so in that group is a lovely gentleman who taught Tony Rodriguez, who um, was part of the um, remote viewing of that one in Bermuda, where he said the consciousness of the craft only let you in if you're of the right frequency. And he saw this huge being in stasis and other beings being grown to what appears to be to pilot the craft, which is conscious. But then um, I told him about the one in Bulgaria um, in the Busetti mountains and asked him about that because I'd found out about the fact that that was a um, ancient technology that had been found in 2003. And in that ancient technology, they were showing that the huge beings had created certain technology. The US knew about it as well as the Romanian government. And I asked him if there was anything there that was related to this. And their group looked at it and they found not only another arc under, under the Vucetti Mountains, plus a huge pyramid and all this ancient technology and another arc that was conscious that looked as though it'd been activated. I got a question, Mary. What are these arcs? What do, or what do they say they are? What, from what we know okay. the best or ability? 
Well, it seems like their craft, uh, uh, ancient technology that seemed to have been put there for a certain time for when humanity was activated or awakened into a higher consciousness. And they were going to be part of this um, show, if you like, to humanity. So what we discovered was that these arcs, there's one in uh, uh, Iraq, Egypt, um, Brazil, Australia, they're buried across the globe. And it seems to be that quite possible that these arcs are um, not only are they activated by consciousness, but they are going to be part of that consciousness awakening when they show themselves. And this is uh, another um, more conspiratorial side was saying there are two arcs actually um, in Ukraine. And that's one of the main reasons why Russia was going in there to stop um, other parties getting hold of that technology. And that was not just the, the bio labs and all the rest of it, but these arcs, um, two of them actually in Ukraine as well. So I think what I'm saying is there's a lot of things going on under the surface that most of the public don't yet know about. But I'll just hold on. I'll just get hold of the book that told me about the Ukraine stuff. Hold on. I'll see if I can. Oh, here it is. Um, I don't know whether you've come across it. It's by Peter Moon and Radu Cinema. But this is all about the Transylvanian, what's actually in there. And that's what they were remote viewing and found the pyramid and the ark underneath, as well as a huge chamber where these intelligences left all that technology. And that's that's the first of about eight or nine books that talk about what's hidden. And this was 2003, where this was all discovered under the Sphinx, um, which is um, in Romania. This is the Sphinx. You can see the Sphinx on the cover. Yeah, I've had so, Peter Moon on my show, but I didn't talk to him about this for some reason. I should have, like... Uh, I, I, mean, but I think this was before this was coming up or maybe we did talk about it. I can't remember. Like, but like, um, I'm going to have to get him back on the show to get his, his opinion on this. What's going on. But like, what I was going to say is this ties deeply into your work as well, kind of in a way, because it's this whole idea that humans are evolving, um, that we're getting a, you, as you say in your book, the new human, you say we're getting an extraterrestrial upgrade. So as, as while the space arcs are waking up or whatever they're doing, it seems like humanity is waking up as well and changing. Is that correct? Well, what seems to be happening as our consciousness is being activated um, and we are, if you like, being upgraded, which I believe is going on now, these arcs are specifically tuned into the consciousness of humanity. And when the understanding is, is when we reach a certain level of awareness, they get become activated. And that is really their purpose, is to then ultimately help with that, that process of, of the awakening of consciousness on this planet. So they were waiting for that. They're waiting for that frequency. And as Tony Rodriguez has said, to get into the craft remote viewing wise, it had to be allowed into onto the craft by his consciousness had to be the right consciousness to allow him actually in there. So depending on your level of awareness, depended on whether or not you were going to given, be given access to going on these arcs, which as I say, are, and, and what was fascinating to me was I, all of this came after the regression that I did with Beth. I knew nothing about the arcs and that's what gave it further validity. And what I will remind people and, I've got no, my own personal thing around this is when there was the invasion of the US into Iraq, because they said Saddam Hussein had technology that they, well, they said it was, he was going to, you know, uh, do something dramatic, um, which, you know, was um, affecting the, 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 you know, some kind of war or, or possible war um, because of what he had. What they were really referring to was this ancient technology which has been found, and they found the tomb of Gil Gilgamesh, which um, from my understanding, it's, it's all part of this ancient technology that's being found. And it was, that was not told the public at all. This was um, kept quiet and it was, you know, he's got um, weapons of mass destruction. That was an excuse to get in and get this technology off Saddam Hussein because of the technology they found. That's more of my understanding of what happened there. That's so interesting. So this kind of ties into like maybe the Anunnaki too, or like a certain extraterrestrial race. It's very possible. What's interesting about the beings they're finding on the craft, they're huge. 
and they're in stasis. And I talked to a lovely lady, I'm trying to think of her name now, who told me she'd been told about this in 2010. She lives in Scotland. And she said to me, I said, so where, how is this going to happen when these avatars um, or, or these beings in stasis are awakened? Where's the consciousness? And she said she'd been shown in 2010, they were in this black box, the consciousness of the being, so that when it was time for this being to operate, the consciousness would go back into the avatar that was in stasis. And this is a Tress Blair that told me about this in, uh, uh, who lives in Scotland. And she'd been told all of this in 2010. And the only reason I met Tress was I was um, speaking at the Awakening Expo in Manchester in August. And she came up to me and said, yes, I know all about this because I was told about it in 2010. So you get all these other links, which to me give even more credibility and, and validation to these kinds of um, stories that you're hearing, you know, it it sort of all ties together. And that's what to me gives it extreme, you know, I take that seriously. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Um, now, I wanted to get into some of your work. Like I wanted to ask you about some, maybe some of the kids you've been working with recently, because I know you work with the kids and um, have you witnessed anything incredible or amazing lately? You usually have some really good, um, uh, stories of some of the people you work with. So I kind of just wanted to see what, where you were at with that and how that was going. Well, there's so many stories. I mean, I, I put some, only a few um, of the many that I'm hearing. Mostly the parents are still quite um, amazed at what their children are coming out with when they start talking about portals, when they start talking about their mission on this planet, when they're talking about being hybrids, for example. I mean, concepts that you don't get in six and seven or eight year olds, you know, they're not stuff you see on the television or whatever. And the interesting thing is about their abilities, which seem to be, you know, not only being able to communicate with animals, but plants, and, and some even, there's one, I remember one six-year-old is describing that he was talking to a meteorite and he explained um, that the meteorite, where it landed, is explaining how, it, how it, it operated as a consciousness and what have you to this. And the mother said to the six-year-old, well, how do you know this? And he said, because it's all in my head. They tell me in my head and then I know what it is. And he it, literally, he described where it landed, what what its purpose was, how it communicated. And this is a meteorite. So, you know, you get this, these kinds of information and you're thinking, well, that's not something a kid can magically imagine, you know, in the way that he described it. And this is the kind of thing, even their energies as well. So what it really says to me is that we are developing a consciousness that means that we can tap into everything around us because everything has a, a sentience of a kind, whether or not we're aware of it or not. And we're aware that also, by the way, all the animals and, uh, are being upgraded as well. So they're becoming a lot more consciously connected to um, this kind of awakening frequency. And this is what Beth Noyes was already told about, was told that the plants also are everything's being activated as it's happening globally. Can you explain that about what Beth was told about the plants? I think that's kind of important, right? Well, what was interesting about the plants, and she drew a picture of it, uh, the ones she was shown that were luminescent and near waterfalls that were going to help mankind. And interestingly, when they remote viewed the one in the Busetti Mountains, there she was seeing the same plants. She was seeing them by a waterfall, exactly what she'd been shown in her regression. But also JP, this whistleblower that Dr. Michael Sala was talking to, actually talked about similar a similar thing, the plant of life. And he was describing something very, very similar to that. So again, you've got this cross pollination of information and it seems to be there are plants that are being gifted to humanity that are gonna help with humanity, whether or not as healing or uh, they've got other properties that are going to help us with our, when we get activated or will help with that activation and perhaps with healing as well. Um, I think we're going to have a whole shift in how we look at health and healing once we um, are, are activated in that higher consciousness. 
Yeah. One thing I think we talked about in a previous interview, and I, I, I had this question written down, so I, I figured I would ask you. I think um, you talked about this. You said that a, root, a fifth root race referenced by Edgar Casey is to appear on the planet. Do you remember talking about this? And can you explain it a little bit? Or you... Well, Edgar Casey puts it out very clearly. I mean, there's lots of different ways we're describing this shift that we're seeing with our different generations of human, like the indigos, crystals, rainbow children, children of light. There's a lot of different names depending on whether or not it's a metaphysical um, explanation or it's a more 3D kind of explanation or whatever. I think Edgar Cayce was coming. I mean, his, his readings were in the, what, 1930s, 1940s or whatever it was. He was coming from it, from that kind of generation of describing the fact that we are literally moving through different levels of consciousness each generation. And what was the interesting thing with my with my work was noticing that they, the links to intergenerational contact, but a different understanding of that. For example, I would ask someone who's, I don't know, in their middle 30s or 40s saying, did your parents ever show any unusual awareness or interest in anything you know, metaphysical or um, intuitive or whatever. And they they would often say, well, my mother or my grandmother was very psychic or very, you know, very intuitive. And granddad was always interested in UFOs. There's your clue that although there was not an understanding in those generations, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, there was a different take on it, but it was still the same thing. And it was coming through the generations. And then we get to, you know, the, the latest generations, which, you know, are given lots of different names, again, you know, from rainbow children, children of light, you know, there's all, all the different ones. And what they're really saying is there's been a, a, a shift and an upgrade in understanding that awakening. So it's it's less and less 3D. The reason in my book, The New Human, I, I put on the back ADHD, Asperger's, some forms of autism and dyslexia, because they have been manifested as dysfunctions in many cases in mainstream but what I was seeing was when people were saying to me they'd had experiences and they'd got a child that had ADHD and and whatever and I'm trying to work out well why would that be why is that seen as a, a negative when I remember Dr. Um, Neil Gold this lovely gentleman who's a ufologist in Hong Kong who wrote the book Close Encounters of the ADHD Kind because he realized in his 50s he was he'd been he would have been diagnosed as ADHD but what he was saying was with his communication with the beings of light and his own awareness he could see far more of the greater picture than the average and he and he said that he'd retranslated that to always dart into higher dimensions so really there's your clue that a lot of those that are operating on that higher frequency that are labeled ADHD, the reason they're struggling is because we're pulling them back down to a lower frequency, which is the 3D programming. And they don't handle that very well unless you drug them because they're not meant to be operating in this 3D reality. They're meant to be multidimensional. So this is, this is where we're getting this pushback from mainstream that are making this out to be a dysfunction when in many cases, actually, they're hyper aware, super aware, more multidimensionally aware, but they have been seen to be dysfunctional because it's not been understood by main mainstream understanding or the social norms. Yeah. One thing I wanted to ask you is what are the differences between the the uh the, the labels of like crystal indigo? Is it like eight by age? So would it, would an indigo be um a generation below me? I'm in my 40s and then what 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 generation would I be? Or is it is it just what what's what constitutes what 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 somebody what category somebody falls under? Um the category is to do with their energy field. Like the indigo has got an indigo energy field. They've come in as the warriors. They've come in to challenge the system. So if you're part of the generation where you want to challenge 3D matrix and what have you, and um, be it as a, a bit of a spiritual warrior where you're a, a rebel, that's the energy of the indigo. Some have come in as, as healers. Um, and, you know, there are some like ones um, are, are coming in with the, the awareness of, uh, the crystalline matrix, but also healing and this kind of thing. So depending on what 
energy and uh, gift that you're bringing in will be the name that could be attributed to you. Because many are coming in as empaths and healers and what have you, and their energy field will reflect their abilities and their awareness. So if you feel you're a bit of a spiritual warrior, and you are, because look what you're doing, you're challenging the system, you're challenging the matrix, I would say you would very much fit in with the indigo persona and, and psyche that you've come in to challenge the system. Yeah. Does, you know, does that Sorry, make sense? Ahead. My my best friend's at, her name's one of my she's one of my good friends she she's a, I do shows with her her name's Indigo Angel and she's uh she she's like a, a generation below me but she's like you know she's very much that way she challenges the system like she uh you know so like that that makes sense but for some reason I had it confused I thought it meant like that there it was like the eight that or maybe somebody told me this that it was like our age brackets were had something to do with it as well yeah or is that not is that mis, a misconception I think within a little, it is within gener some generations that you're going to get the indigos coming in. So, you know, you might get that over a 20 year period where you've got indigos coming in around that time because they've got to fit in with the culture and the program of that time. So they'll come in where they can challenge the most. So that's that will be related then to their energy field and their their mission and their purpose. So, you know, it may be that you've got different pro programs for or, or different <coughs> generations, depending on what country you're born in, for example, because we've got so many different belief systems, so many different understanding of culture and what have you that may need challenging in a different way, but still an indigo energy that needs to do that. I mean, I was talking, I wrote about this Indian, young Indian adult who wrote to me saying he was a star kid. And, I, and he said, my problem is that my culture and my um, countrymen, they worship all these gods. We've got about 100 gods, he said. And they worship these gods, he said. And my problem is that I know they're not gods. I know they're just ETs. They're non-human intelligences. But I can't say that to them because to them, they're still in the culture that these are all gods. And that's what they believe in. So he's in a way, he's, he's you know, he's an indigo with that because he's he's already trying to challenge the system in his culture and what have you. So I think there's a certain flexibility with that, but it's it's really the energy and the mission that creates the energy field that we're talking about. Yeah. Well, where are you at with uh, how we receded here? Do you have an opinion on that? Like, do you think it was the Anunnaki or do you think it was like multiple different races or do you, where do you, what do you think about that is, um, it, it, different people have different theories. Some people say we were seeded by like 24 different races of ETs, where some people think we were just genetically modified by the Anunnaki. Um, I'm not sure if I ever asked you about that. Well, like many, you know, you research and you get information from different sources. When um, uh, the uh, command sergeant, Robert Dean, who, who was very well known in ufology, um, was um, in the army, came across Cosmic Top Secret and realized that this was there was a lot more going on in terms of the ETs and our rea this reality and what have you. He admitted it later on in life before he passed on a few years ago that he'd been up on a craft. He finally admitted he was an experiencer. And he said they had told him that we were the product of 12 different races. And that actually our future was magnificent once we go through the shift. But since then, I've heard other whistleblowers mention as many as 22. So, you know, take your pick. Certainly, I've always felt Dr. Uh, Command Sergeant Robert Dean was one of the most highly trustworthy with the m amazing integrity that uh, I met him several times. And I certainly get, give some cred credential or, or some credibility to his story. But there may be more. Maybe um, it may be in some places that it was 12, maybe in others in different parts of the world it, there was more. There is no doubt that we are hybrids. We are hybrids of many different races. <laughs> and one of the interesting things is one of the star seeds I talked to when he was only 16 was explaining that it's all in our DNA that, and what we're tapping into as our heritage. Some say, well, I think I'm a Pleiadian or a Taurian or I come from Orion or whatever. 
what he's saying is whatever the frequency is that we're connecting to in our DNA is how we'll express ourselves. So in other words, if we're um, activating the Pleiadian aspect of our DNA, that's what we will relate to. But that doesn't mean that's the only insert of, of uh, DNA aspect that we we are, because I believe we're multiples. And that's why it's said we are so invaluable and so uh, important as a species, because we can express so many of these different races when, when we are actually activating those parts of our DNA as well. And that's what's happening now is this this whole because we've got, I believe, when I talk to and work with people in regressions or in hypnosis and whatever. One of the things that may come out of that is I will ask them to tap into any other origins that they may have and they may tap into Arcturus or they may tap into Pleiades. They may tap into a star system that is not in this dimension. And they'll say, I come from another dimension. So we've got not just these galaxies that we see as the, you know, the, the material side of, of our reality, but the non-physical um, or the ones in other dimensions. So they will say, I remember a 10 year old telling me that he came through a portal in the sun. Um, when I was um, doing a regression with um, a young man who was an artist, and he'd come in, he said from another dimension, his artwork was meant to trigger perception to realize that we have, uh, you know, there is the matrix and that we are very limited in how we see reality. And part of this activation is so that we can see more of what's really going on because our visual spectrum is very, very limited. But with the new ones coming in, everything's ex um, expanded, like our, our eyesight, our hearing, our, our sense of smell, touch is all hypersensitive, more than the norm. And this is why so many of the new ones coming in struggle because everything becomes very overwhelming for them and they, you know, they will retreat and they're often picked on at school or bullied because they're so sensitive, but they're tapping into so much more and they're struggling with that. And many end up being homeschooled because they get bullied because other children see the, feel the difference and, and don't, are not comfortable with it. So they get, you know, what kids are like, if you're any different in any way, they'll pick on you. And so these poor souls get get picked on quite a bit. Yeah, I, I kind of wanted to go back to Bro Sergeant Robert Dean for a minute. I, I I find him very interesting, and I also feel like there's somewhat of a disconnect within the newer people that are coming up in ufology. They don't know the old school guys, like people like Robert Dean. Mm -hmm. Can you just talk about Robert Dean for a minute, like what he did, and like yeah. and and his. Uh, and your interactions with him, because I kind of want to, um, I kind of want to, um, I kind of want to blend the old school researchers with like, 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 for example, like you've been very well, like to stay up to date with like the newest trends of what's going on. So I wouldn't consider you an old school researcher, but you know, a lot of the old school researchers. So you were able to like blend the two, like, you know, the old school researchers, but then you, you tap into the new information as well. Like you you know, about the space arcs and, and you work yeah. with all these kids that are, that are star seeds and stuff like that. So um, I think that's important. I think that we have to know both. Um, what do you, what are your thoughts about that? And can you talk about Robert Dean a little bit? Absolutely. I mean, there are some wonderful researchers that have come from more of the the old school way of bringing this information. One of the things, you know, we say is, you know, the, uh, they call it the nuts and bolts of ufology, which has been so important in previous generations to show the tangibility of this. You know, who who has seen the craft, who's seen the beings? Um, the hard thing for experiences was that they couldn't bring a piece of the craft to prove that it had experiences other than their own experience and whatever. So it was always hard in the old world of ufology for them to get credibility because it seemed too esoteric. We've now discovered through some of our um, research with the Dr. Edgar Mitchell Free Foundation where those that are having experiences out of the 4,000 odd that had experiences that we um, surveyed, that 75% of experiences are out of body. So it's very hard for them then to be able to qualify that. So in old school, that wasn't given the credibility it, it deserved. I mean, Linda Morton Howe's done a beautiful job in bringing more of the, the, the bigger picture into this. And Sergeant, you know, Command Sergeant Robert Dean was really up there 
as one of the most credible because he was in the army. It was when he was in shape in Europe that he came across the documents that said cosmic top secret that showed that the military knew all about the ETs, had got, got down craft, had got beings and what have you. And it blew his mind because he had no idea that this was a reality. And for a while, I think he kept stum about it, but gradually he wanted to expose the, you know, the, the truth embargo that's on this whole subject. And he started to explain, you know, what they actually knew, what he knew, putting it out in his wonderful presentation. They're still very much worth watching because he brings in some fabulous stuff about craft in, around the rings of Saturn um, and all the other stuff that they, you know, that hasn't, hadn't been put out there. And I'll tell you, I first met him in Brisbane in, I think, 1999, I think it was. And he was one of two, Dr. Joe, Lo, Joe, um, Joe Lewis was another one of the old, older ones that had, those two blew my mind because I'd gone over to, I had only just been a few years in this by that time. And the information was so powerful and so uh, concrete and, and valid that I remember having my mind blown. And it, it was the first time I met um, both of them. And I, I just, I couldn't thank them enough for the the way that it had given me so much more understanding. And he's, as I say, it's still worth going and seeing his his presentations because he shows all the different ways that the craft are um, hidden in clouds. He showed one of a military base where you saw literally the cloud um, literally covering, slowly covering the craft as it, it it hides itself and this kind of so really tangible stuff really positive nuts and bolts reality and and that's what he was doing and it was really wonderful though that gradually you got more of a sense of his spiritual journey with it and and from that of course he'd never disclosed until in the last few years that he'd actually been up on the craft and that was when i found you know it Really, that was it made it made it even more understandable why he's so passionate to get the truth out, because he knew in his heart because of his own experiences that he'd had these this um, contact. And what I will say about a lot of people within the ufology field, even if they've not admitted it, many of them, the reason they've been so passionate, um, Rob, is because actually it's been personal, even if they've not uh, um, come out with the fact that um, that's been part of the motivating factor, that it's it's actually personal. And well, that's what I've found. Most people are experiencers, you're saying, and they, some people don't want to. Yeah, exactly. They don't own it. And the reason they haven't owned it is because our society, as soon as you own multidimensional experiences or you're a bit intuitive or a bit psychic, people say, oh, they're a bit this or they're a bit new age or they're a bit, you know, you can't trust them now because they've lost the plot without realizing that what it's really showing us is how limited our 3D reality is and that we're all multidimensional and we all have ability to um, uh, connect to our multidimensional world in and through intuition, sensing, knowing, feeling, all of that's information from our multidimensional senses. Yeah, and, and, what, and one of the questions I had for you was, uh, what kind of experiences do you see people are having? I, I, it seems like people aren't having the gray abductions anymore. And I've talked to people about this before. It seems like people have really opened up to contact with all different kinds of beings, like all different kinds of beings. Whereas for a long time, it just seemed like people were having the experiences with the gray aliens. And I don't know why that was, or do you think people were seeing all different kinds of beings all along and maybe we just weren't hearing about it or, um, you know what I mean? Or do you, or do, or do. Do you feel like do. people are still having the gray abductions or are they done now? In answer to that, the, the, the fact was that the only thing that was being put out in the media was the scary stuff. So anyone that had had, you know, the, the the scary kind of experiences were the ones that was promoted, was talked about and what have you, because that drew people's attention. There have been many people having most loving, connected experiences all along that don't didn't talk about it because that wasn't believed, because that was that was too loving, that was too, too warm and fuzzy. And, you know, the only ones that grabbed attention were the scary was the scary stuff. But do remember also that even with some of the Zetas and whatever, not all of them are the same and not all of them are. Some of them are self-serving, of course, but from what I've learned. 
but m there's a, a great deal of those that are not self-serving, that are actually part of this greater picture of activating and, and educating um, humanity on another level of consciousness. And there have been a number of people that have realized that their heritage, their star heritage is connected to the Zetas and that they've been one of those beings. And I remember a seven-year-old explaining that he was a being that looked like one of those with only four digits coming from the future. And he'd come from the future to the past, we call the past because it's all now in the way they understand it, because he's got something to do here. And he was also educated into understanding what that meant and what his mission was. So, and also on top of that, the reason some of them have been highlighted because they were um, traumatic has been because they weren't actually the Zetas. They were actually programmed life forms they were exposed to, which are grown by the military and the MyLab. And they are generally very traumatic because the these the sources that abduct them and they have the same technology to abduct them as as the ETs, the military have that equipment. They want to know what's going on board the craft. They interrogate them. They drug them. And Niara Isley um, is a wonderful lady that wrote a book on her experiences with the MyLab, and she had, had been in in the military herself. And she had really traumatic experiences. And it was um, her book, Facing the Shadow, Embracing the Light, is her story about waking up to the fact that she'd had these experiences with the military in underground bases. And it's all about downloading the information that they want to know that the, that the ETs are up to. And that's their way of finding out. So there's lots of reasons why some were very traumatic and not all because of, you know, evil aliens. Do you, but it, do, you, do you get, a, I'm sorry, I was going to say, do you get a lot of my lab cases? Do you get a lot of people who are still having my lab? I still get some that have had my lab for sure um, because they're still doing it. Um, what that, you know, again, it's their way of accessing as much information as possible that's going on on board craft. And I remember one gentleman in England saying to me, Mary, they use me, the military, you know, the military watch my house and watch, what I'm doing because these beings come in for me, they're coming in through a portal. And when they're coming in, I can tap into that. So they're tapping into me to wait for these, these craft to actually come and appear so that they can, they can access that. So, you know, this is, this is quite amazing that they're able to do that, but he was aware he was being used by the military because they were accessing when he was called or he, they called him because a lot of experiences know when to go outside and take pictures of the craft. They instinctively get a message or a feeling or a knowing or a sensing that the craft is out there and they'll find themselves going out there with the camera and taking the pictures. And we've got several that do that here. Um, Peter Slattery is one of them. And there's a, a number of those in, uh, you know, in Australia that just get the message um, and they'll go out and there's the craft you know, there's the lights doing the thing and what have you. There's, it's all over the world. There's so many that are, are doing that now. Yeah. Um, on the my labs, though, so do you feel like the government has the same uh, or is just as good of technology as the ETs? Like as far as like being able to abduct people and they can maybe produce holograms and stuff like that? Or, or do they have their own race of greys that they're working with to do the abductions? My understanding is they may be working with certain groups, but they've got the technology to do much of what, you know, that these ETs are doing now because there's been a trade from my understanding and they can do all these things. I, I was told, I think it was one whistleblower or whatever was saying they've got technology, anything from 30 years in advance to a thousand years in advance of what we, we're being shown. That's the ETs, but our government has at least the ability or the technology of at least 30 plus years um, in advance of what we are being given on the planet or we're being shown on the planet. So goodness knows ultimately what is possible in terms of what can be done now. And we're only just getting, you know, scratching the surface, I think, um, Rob, to be honest. Do you think uh, I heard you say this goes into my last question I have for you. I was this is uh, I heard you talking in another interview that some of these children can open up a flower bud with their mind or they can describe what's a photograph blindfolded or influence and move objects with their mind. 
So do you think like the government is, so two questions, do you think the government's looking for that? Are they looking for the people that have the psi abilities because they want to study them? And then do you still get those cases of those kids who can do that? So kind of two questions there. Sorry. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't want to forget what I'm going to ask you. So I, I you know, I, I just kind of, yeah. you know. Oh, look, they know, they know for well the abilities they teach, you know, the kids can levitate, the kids can, can, um, they, they, teach many of them or they know they have the abilities in underground bases to do these things there's a book called china super psychics by paul dong i've forgotten the other author that came out in the late 80s and it was all about the the china working with these super psychic kids and what they could do such as open a flower with the bud with their mind moving objects teleportation all this kind. this was in the 1980s um and he you know he wrote about all of this stuff you can bet your bottom dollar. Um, I've heard of stories of what they can do in Russia. Um, one of them was by uh, Duncan Rhodes, who's the Nexus editor. And he went there and he said to me, Mary, they can put a book un sort of under their arm and they can absorb all the information and you, you can ask them what's on a page and what have you. And they can, they can tell you exactly what's on the page. So in other words, they're absorbing the information in a completely different way other than their eyesight and what have you. This is just some of the the abilities we all will have. This is not. This is just the the um, the precursor to showing us where we're going. But goodness knows what else they can do. Um, one of the things is obvious that um, I've met a number that have been in these underground bases as children, and been shown and uh, showing that they could levitate, they could walk through walls, they could do all these different things, and this was part of the the program that is being hidden from us about the abilities of these children and their, uh, and what they can do. So absolutely, you know, this is well known. And I think that what, what's also very interesting, and I showed a very limited version of that is children seeing without sight and being trained to do it and being shown how to do it. And there's various academies now, which were children from six to 12 often to start with adults can do it, but they take a bit longer where they're shown how to use their consciousness to read, to recognize colors, to, and I've got one 13 year old boy, literally with this particular blindfold um, mask on, driving around his block, missing trees, all the rest, literally driving on, on the block. No way. <laughs> I've, got, I've got a video of it where he's actually <sighs> driving around with his, his eyes completely blocked. That's um, amazing. Oh yeah. And it's in, it's in Australia. It's only, this lady who's teaching them now is a grandmother and it's her grandson. And she's, you know, three, three hours south of me. She's teaching a lot of children how to uh, literally read with their consciousness, walk, uh, 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 recognize energy and a whole range of remote view, all these things. And they're, they're kids from anything from six to 12 or just over where they're doing remote viewing. They're doing all this different stuff. And, it, and she's helping them to expand their abilities. This is being done, being trained in England um by another lady who is showing kids how to do this it's it's being done in mexico it's being done in china it's being done in india the this awareness is really not that difficult it's just that we've not realized that we can actually see without our physical sight that we can actually operate without it once you know how it works and it's and the kids learn it very easily because they're so open to things we take a bit longer because of our programming yeah yeah it's the indoctrination right it's almost like they they why well, they say there's those kids who they, they have those reincarnation memories up until they're about three or four years old and then it seems mm -hmm. to like stop like because maybe that's the point where they're starting to get indoctrinated or or do yes. you think it's something like maybe yes. the soul finally leaves the body or something like, or no, it wouldn't be in the body, but like, I don't know. What do you think about that? Have you, have you heard about those cases? And uh, do you, do you think that, that that's, have you had kids like that, that remember past lives? I don't know if I've ever asked you this before, like kids who will remember, uh, you know what I mean? Oh, yes. Uh, I've, I've talked to them. One of them was a little eight year old um, and in another country whose mother said that she'd admitted she was a hybrid and she was talking to me. I even got the picture of her hybrid water being, which she was from another planet. She was on a water planet, she told me, and she is a water being. And when she looks in the mirror, she's seeing herself as the water being, not human. 
And she actually do a, drew a picture and says, I'm part water being, part human. And she'd literally drawn the picture of, of that. And she explained her ability, which is when she hears music, she's not just hearing the frequency in the music, she's going to where that music came from, the origin of that music, and she can work out what's actually going on with the individual who's creating the music. So she takes it to a whole new level of awareness and understanding. She's eight. Wow. <laughs> wow. It's, it's unreal. Like the, it's, it's exciting times. Like, um, it, so do you see a lot of promise with the future of our, um, the, of the kids that are coming up nowadays? Well, actually, that's what keeps me going because the world is in such chaos at the moment and there are so many dark things going on, which are the, the clearing to the whole awakening of humanity. We've got to, you know, it's always darkest before the dawn, they say. And I think certainly we're being shown a lot of the darkness and people say to me, is it ever going to change? Are we finally going to get some, you know, beautiful future that our children deserve and, and our grandchildren and all the rest of it? And I'm saying my way of looking at this is you've got over numerous generations now you're having these new awakened beings that are coming to our planet from all over the cosmos and, and other dimensions with their abilities with their awareness i don't think they're coming for a waste of time yeah I think they're coming because they have something they know they can do when that shift happens and that's what i cling to because again it would make no sense for these amazing souls that have come in with all this awareness they wouldn't have bothered if if they ha weren't going to make a difference and that's what i think we need to keep remembering yeah, i agree well that this has really been interesting well let me ask you this is there anything else that you want to share that we might have that you feel might may be important that what i might have forgot to ask you like um anything you that you kind of have the floor or whatever you would like to talk about or you know Oh, Rob, I think we've covered a, a, a wonderful um, amount okay. of information. Hopefully we'll expand. What I would say to people is I know it's a difficult time right now. And I think it's very hard to hang on to, you know, what's that hope that we are going to evolve into this amazing higher species of human and what have you. And it's hard sometimes to believe that given everything that's thrown at us at the moment and whatever. Just just know that, you know, birth is painful, <laughs> you know, um, oh. for anything new, anything beautiful, there's got to be um, a process that's going to activate you, challenge you um, on many, many levels. But hang into the fact you've come here to be part of this. You've come to be part of an amazing shift in this consciousness that we call human and to know that we're here because we're part of it. And we're here to experience it and to know that our kids are going to have a future because they will. Wow. That's really well said. Well, Mary, thank you so much for taking your time out to do this today. Like I, I appreciate, I know everybody's busy and everybody's got a lot of shit going on right now. So like, I really appreciate you taking your time out to, uh, to talk with me because it means a lot, you know, like, and um, do you want to tell everybody where they can find your books and your website? And again, thank you so much. Uh, look, Google Mary Rodwell, um, .com .au or ascern.com.au. You can um, find me on Facebook as well. So they're the main ones and some social media, Telegram, as well as Messenger and what have you. Um, the books are available through numerous distributors. I actually send them out if you're in Australia and what have you. And I will be talking on Portal to Ascension in January. Um, I'm going to be on the 15th on Monday. Portal to Ascension, um, there's going to be links. And there's something, I've forgotten how many speakers, something like 40 speakers or something. I'm the last wow. one in there that's going to be t talking about some of the more important, greater um, information that's going to be out from all different levels. So it'll be something else. I'm pretty certain it's 40 speakers, but I, um, I'll put the links up for that in my Facebook anyway. So look, hopefully you'll join us in that as well. Definitely. Definitely. And yeah, definitely. And thank you, Mary. And, uh, and if you want, send me the link for that, or I can even look it up and I'll, I'll post it in the YouTube so people can sign up. Perfect. for it. Thank you. That'd be All perfect. All right. Thanks, okay. Mary. Have a good night. Take care. And